Hey there, Canaanites, welcome back. As I'm sure you've heard, or perhaps you've guessed based on the title or the preview image, this week we'll cover the upcoming novel, Shadow of Intent. So, let's dive in. Halo Shadow of Intent will mark the return of Halo veteran Joseph Staten and, as many have guessed, the return of the half-jaw himself, Urtas Vadum. This week we get our first taste of what that will entail with the novella's description. After decades of grim combat against the humans and then the traitorous Covenant prophets, the Sanghili warrior Urtas Vadum, the half-jaw, has earned a long rest. But not all of the prophets perished in their holy city, High Charity, and now one of their fearsome prelates has sworn his vengeance. This powerful threat has set a cataclysmic plan in motion, a plan to lure the Halfjaw into a trap that will herald the utter destruction of the entire Sanghili race. So damn, that sounds pretty interesting. It sounds like we're going to get some insight into what happened to the Prophets following the fall of the Covenant. Hopefully that might also include some insight into what happened to the many engineers that once serviced the Covenant. The common theory is that the Prophets took them when they went into hiding. We'll have to wait and see. Speaking of the Prophets, I have to wonder exactly what this Prophet is planning. What might he have that could utter the destruction of the entire Sanghili race? Some forerunner device? A piece of leftover Covenant technology? Something else? I can't wait to find out. Finally, let's take a look at this cover. We have good old Halfjaw strangely in his Halo 2 armor, although it could be that the Halo 2 Anniversary armor set was meant to be a total retcon, or it could be a stylistic choice for the cover. Or Urtas might have just favored this armor set, who knows. Behind him, we have a Sanghili that looks to be wearing Arbiter armor. Make no mistake though, this is not the Arbiter, nor Sanghili we've seen before. This is our first proper sighting of a female Sanghili. Yeah, we had Han in Halo Legends, but her appearance was heavily stylized. This is the first true, canon image of a female Sanghili, and I can't wait to read more about her and that strangely Arbiter-like armor set of hers. Going through the Waypoint forums, a member had the idea that this could be the Sanghili who designed the Helioskril Mjolnir armor, the armor set designed to loosely resemble the classic Arbiter armor. Kind of like a certain female Sanghili's armor, yeah? The idea is a bit of a stretch, lacking any real evidence, but I'll be honest, it definitely caught my attention and got me thinking. I hope this turns out to be the case. Finally, let's talk about that energy stave. Well, there's not really much to talk about, but damn is it cool. Moving forward, the article brings up the recent Halo 5 opening cinematic trailer. It's absolutely awesome, and if you haven't seen it already, click here. I also did an in-depth breakdown, which you can see by clicking here. Although, by the flood of comments I've been getting, I think most of you have seen it by now. But it's an awesome trailer, watch it again. Speaking of Halo 5, Grimm gives us a look at another Halo 5 map, Plaza. Plaza is set in the same city as Empire and Eden, Noctis, capital of the colony, and Desia. This map in particular gives us some insight into the planet's early history. Her colonization efforts funded by biotech consortiums, and Desi has a rich ecosystem perfect for research into life-extending pharmaceuticals and exotic foodstuffs. After the colony was established, development focused on medical research and ultratech industries such as Promesa, the actual setting for Plaza. As we know from the descriptions for Eden and Empire, the colony saw heavy insurrectionist activity prior to the Covenant War. In the post-war era, Spartan Fours are training in simulated areas for the eventuality of an insurrectionist return. At this point, we have three maps set on Andesia. Given that a good number of maps we've seen are set on locations we'll actually be visiting in the campaign, I can't help but wonder if Andesia might be one of the colonies we visit at some point, either as Blue Team or as Osiris. And again, we have mention of insurrectionists. I've pretty much given up on the idea that insurrectionists will be present in Halo 5, but God, 343 really knows how to tease us. But anyway, that ends the main article and brings us to the new, or updated, universe entries. This week we have Epsilon Eridani 3, or Tribute, Commander Michael Sully, Sullivan, and Shield World 0001, or Requiem. We start out with Tribute, the third rock from Epsilon Eridani. Tribute was one of many colonies in the system, possibly up to six in total. I say possibly because we know of six colony worlds in the system, but one has only ever been identified as Epsilon Eridani 4, meaning one of the named planets could turn out to be Epsilon Eridani 4. According to UEG records, Tribute was colonized on August 8, 2364, with the landing of the CAA Casbah. However, personnel from the CAA Irbid claimed they had landed weeks earlier on July 24th. In 2524, Operation Trebuchet, a long-running counterinsurgency program, came to tribute when the UNSC learned of insurrectionist cells on the planet. Though the insurrectionists were initially popular among the population due to perceptions of them as freedom fighters, that support quickly waned when the fighting spread, and insurrectionists turned to bombings and assassinations, often with civilian casualties. 
Insurrectionist activity continued for the next few decades, but the Covenant War and restrictions on inter-system travel largely cut them off from any support. When the Covenant arrived in the Epsilon Eridani system in 2552, tribute was also burned by the Covenant's Holy Flame. During one of the final battles in the capital of Kasbah, a Spartan fireteam held off Covenant forces and provided cover for civilian evac transports. The events were later immortalized in the War Games Simulator. Pausing a moment, I have to wonder who this Spartan team was. Now, I don't know about you, but my thoughts immediately went to one of the three Spartan 3 teams mentioned in Halo Reach, Gauntlet, Red, and Echo. Sir, that true about Gauntlet, Red, and Echo teams assigned to civilian evac ops? Those are Tribute ultimately wasn't too heavily glassed thanks largely to the discovery of Alpha Halo. As the Prophets started consolidating their forces, remaining ships, while still targeting human forces, largely waited for new orders while moving orbital debris in preparation for a planetary cleansing that would never come. In November, with the outbreak of the Great Schism, Sangheili and Jarl Hanai forces began fighting amongst each other in the skies above the planet. Post-war, the planet survived enough that it is on the path to recovery. So, a very interesting article that provides a lot of new information and insight into the campaign at Tribute. Imagine fighting the Covenant for months, only to watch them suddenly turn and start firing upon one another. Next up is Michael Sully Sullivan. If you've seen Halo 4 Forward Unto Dawn and listened to Hunt the Truth Season 1, you're pretty familiar with Sully's story. The major addition the article provides is insight into Sully's transition from hacker to Oni Senior Communications Director. Sully saw firsthand the fall of a planet early in the war and had to watch his friends killed before him. As anyone might guess, this had quite the profound effect on him as, during his military career, Sully would often go to any extreme against the Covenant. This brought him to the attention of Oni, who recruited him for his talents with information gathering, knowledge synthesis, and cryptography. As we know, the post-war era saw Sully's promotion to Senior Communications Director at Section 2, and in 2558, he would reach out to Benjamin Giroux to do a profile on the legendary Master Chief, the same Spartan that had saved Sully's life more than 30 years before. Finally, we have Requiem. While the summary hasn't been updated, we do get better looks at the various sites seen during Spartan Ops and in War Games. First up is the Apex site, once thought to have been a translocation hub, giving easy access to the many environments that spanned Requiem. Scientists now believe that it may have had other functions, the scans taken of the site revealing deep insight into Forerunner translocation technology. Next up is Lockup, thought to have been a staging area for mid-sized Forerunner ships. Data acquired from the area would seem to indicate that the site was relevant to the first deployments against ancient humans, including the Didax flagship, Mantle's Approach. Next up we have the Cauldron, thought to be a thermal processing system used in the stabilization of atmosphere pockets deep in the planet. Then we have the Refuge. Though the site's true purpose remains unknown, it is thought by many to be the home of a safe house of some sort, hence the name. Finally, for Spartan Ops, we have the Warrens, a series of caves and underground Forerunner structures and a strategic location near the Apex site. Data recovered here by Spartan Team Crimson led to the discovery of an important Covenant dig site. Next up, we have the War Games maps, starting with Complex, the home of UNSC Galileo Base. Interestingly, the article claims that Oni enforced a policy of constant combat readiness. I'm guessing they didn't have much security staff on base, seeing as Dr. Alexander was able to turn off the weapons to test his new reactor. I know how much people hate Palmer's constant use of the egghead term, but it was definitely warranted in this instance. Freaking eggheads. Next up, we have Forge Island, or the Great Anvils. Not much to say, really. They're big, circular islands for forging. Oh, and if you didn't know, creating custom maps is a canon thing the UNSC does. Next up is Haven, one of Requiem's many harmonic resonance platforms used to create and maintain artificial suns. Then we have Ragnarok, known best to fans as the remake of the beloved Valhalla. Towers like these have remained a mystery since the early days of the franchise, though at least one function they serve is as communication towers, sending specific commands to remote locations on the structure. Next up we have Ravine. What we see in the map is but the apex of a much larger installation whose true purpose remains a mystery. However, the most accepted theory considers them automated battlements on an inconceivably large castle. And we end with Vortex, which is basically a giant wind power generator. And that brings this week to a close. Check out the full articles and definitely give the universe entries a read. The Requiem sites give detailed insight into the behind the scenes happenings surrounding the second Requiem campaign, detailing how and sometimes when scans of these locations were taken and the challenges faced. That's all for now and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. 
You are the reason I get to keep doing this. So thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.